Uh, we are now just nine days away from Christmas. I don't know whether that evokes in you a sense of like excitement, maybe if you're a young kid, um, maybe it's, 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 you're starting to think about what might be under the Christmas tree and what all that means, you're getting hopeful about that. Maybe it, in, it invokes in you a sense of panic um, because you know your kids are getting excited and there's not, you don't have things for under the Christmas tree and there's stress or maybe you've got a lot of different activities going on, you're just trying to figure out how to manage all of it. And we've been talking about, over the last couple of weeks, how Advent is intended to be a time of, of preparation and expectation. How we, how we are intended to come into this space to be able to remember and recall our, our need prior to the arrival of Jesus and how God would, in this incredible act of, of grace and love, make provision for that need by sending us Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. So the, at the outset here, I want to just ask the question, how are you doing? How, how intentional have you been about creating space to enter into this season, to enter into kind of the, 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 the waiting and the anticipation? And I, I do not say this to make you feel guilty because you're not doing enough. And, and in fact, that's perhaps one of the pitfalls of our cultural celebration of Christmas, right? Is we, there's so much surrounding this time of year. There's so much that's going on, so many work parties, and good, a lot of it's good stuff. Things that are fun, and, and it's relational, and yet it can be so full that it can be difficult for us to, to create time to be still, to create time to remember, to feel the weight of of the joy of hope given in the midst of darkness, as Isaiah talks about it. Not because we are spiritually obligated to do so, not not because, but because it's a gift for us, because it's intended to be something that is restorative for us. And so we've got we've got nine days. And my hope and my prayer is that we that we will, that I will, take that time to enter in to remember once again, the gift of God with us. Collectively, we've been, we've been trying to do that. We've been trying to enter in that space together. As we've been looking at these verses from the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in the ninth chapter, where Isaiah not only proclaims the promise of, of God's intervention into the midst of the brokenness, this future salvation that he is going to bring, But he also describes God's saving activity to us as a child who would be born, a son who would be given. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, there's there's some mystery in this description here, particularly when we think about those who are hearing this some 700 years prior to the arrival of Jesus. I've made some, some comments over the last couple of weeks about all the Hallmark movies that, that are on surrounding Christmas. I don't know if you're a fan of those or whatever. I have four women in my house, so the Hallmark channel is, is regularly on. And, and uh, I've noticed like a reoccurring plot line in some of these movies. And that is there's some relationship forming, but one of the people in the relationship has some, something to hide. There's something about them that they are not making readily known to the person. And so it's like they show up into some small town in rural America, and they've been sent by the big angry bank to go close down the Christmas tree farm because they're not making money. But he falls in love with the daughter of the family of the Christmas tree farm, right? And it's all sort of coming together. And then there's that moment after they've sort of fallen in love, and there's usually a kiss and it's snowing gently at this time. And then they discover that this element, this aspect of the relationship that, that he had not yet revealed becomes known, and how is that going to affect everything? And all of a sudden, like, the bank changes their mind, and the Christmas farm is saved, and they live in this rural town in America happily ever after, right? And, and Isaiah's point, part of his objective here in, in describing to us and writing to us is to help define the relationship, to help us understand 
who God is sending so that we can know him, so that there's not this, this hidden, this secret thing that we have to overcome. God created us for relationship with him, and he's going to restore our capacity for that relationship by sending us Jesus to become one of us in order that the people of Israel might, might understand, might know what they're hoping for Isaiah describes their coming Messiah, their their soon um, coming Savior. And he says he's going to be a wonderful counselor. Jesus is the wisdom of God in human form. We, We understand God's plan. We understand his way of doing things through the person and work of Jesus. So as we've talked about, we said his wisdom is life, and his counsel is to show us the love of the Father by revealing to us the good news of his kingdom. And then last week, if you were here, we talked about this description of of Jesus as our mighty God, the one who is mighty in capacity, the one who's mighty in victory over sin and death. He's mighty in in results or the outcome. And he's, he's mighty in his love for you. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this, Isaiah says. His his great passion, his deep devotion for you is what drives him to send his son to enter our mess in order to restore and redeem us. He, he covers all of that distance between us and him. And so now this morning, we want to look at Aya's description of of the promised one, of the Messiah, that he will be our everlasting father. Our everlasting father. Let's look one more time at Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We'll read this together and, uh, and, and hear again his words to the people of Israel. Um, and again, just sort of contextually here, Isaiah is speaking into a group of people who are in a critical situation, both spiritually, nationally, politically. All of it is sort of collapsing around them. And and so now Isaiah is going to deliver this word of hope. And this is what he writes. He says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. And he'll reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, of all the the terms that Isaiah uses to describe this coming Messiah, it's this this term of, of everlasting Father that I think is, creates perhaps the most confusion. Because typically when we talk about Jesus, when we speak about God, and we talk about him in the context of the Trinity, we talk about Jesus as the Son, the Son of God, right? I mean, that's the the, the typical verbiage that we use to describe who he is and what he came to do and how he relates in in the context of of the Trinity. So why now is, is Isaiah describing the Son as the Father, as our everlasting Father? And what is the significance of that? What does he want us to get from that in verse 6? There's a couple things I want us to look at together. First is, is I think Isaiah is speaking into the degree of his divine nature. The degree of his divine nature. Isaiah, Isaiah here, he wants us and he wanted the people of Israel to grasp something important about who Messiah, who Jesus would be. And that is simply that he is fully God. He's fully God. I don't know if you growing up ever had one of those moments where you asked like mom and dad for a particular toy or a particular article of clothing or whatever it was. And when mom and dad were doing their shopping, they're going out, they're trying to maybe save a few dollars or get something that seems a little bit more reasonable. And so they get the knockoff version of the thing that you want, right? And, and you open it and you look at it and it's kind of like what you want but maybe not fully what you want, right? I actually found, just as a couple examples, this is some word you wise parents out there about maybe what, what to avoid this Christmas. The first one I found, so I just Googled like knockoff toys. 
This is a toy collection. It's called the Sense of Right Allegiance, Alliance. And so it's basically taken the Justice League. This is some toy company somewhere who's like, hey, we got a bunch of leftovers, guys. How are we going to get rid of these? And so they put some superheroes together. They threw in Shrek, apparently, a Power Ranger, and Lightning McQueen. Um, and, and basically took the Justice League and said, like, we'll, we'll create some weird other version of this and see if parents fall for it, right? And then another one, maybe for younger kids, that you might be looking for this, is the Thomas the Train Tank, nope, Thomas the Train Transformer, right? And so it's like all these Thomas the Train toys put together and made somehow into a Transformer version. Or if you're my age, and this is my personal favorite, this is called uh, Star Knight. It's like Darth Vader on a chips motorcycle. <laughs> if you find one of these on eBay, please let me know. Like, I would, I would love this. You see, like, we look at these things, and, and, and we get that this is what this is meant to be, but it's a, it's a diluted version of the real deal. See, so when Isaiah speaks to the people of Israel, they are living in the midst of a culture surrounded, surrounding them that believed in and worshipped multiple gods. In fact, the notion or the idea that God would, would send a representative, that he might even send some uh, offspring into humanity in order to relate to them or connect to them or provide for them in some way, that that's not entirely foreign. But when they experienced that, when that was true in, in, in religions and pagan worship outside of Israel, when that, that representative, that person, whoever that was, came, they were not the fullness of God. Because they were a created being of whoever it was that they worshipped. So they might have had some of the qualities, or they might have had some of the power of God, but they weren't the fullness of him because they were the result of, of whatever pagan god they worshipped. In short, they, they were knock-off versions of these deities. But Isaiah now, he, he wants the people to understand that this isn't what God is saying here. God is, isn't sending a reduced or an inferior version of himself to dwell among us. He, and how do we know this? Because the one who is coming is defined as everlasting. He is eternal. This is one of the qualities that distinguish the Jewish people worship of Yahweh from every other ancient culture. That God was one and he existed from eternity past and he will exist for all eternity future. He isn't the result of someone else's creative activity. No one spoke him into being. He is, and he was, and he always will be. Later in Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah describes Yahweh, God, as, as the high and exalted one. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. So the same the same word to describe their God is used for the one whom God is going to send. He is the fullness of God, the, the eternal one. Now, I think as finite beings, we, we always will be limited by our nature and our capacity and ability to understand the eternal one, eternity. It just we're, our limits prevent us from fully grasping that. It's like we can get the idea, but it, but we do have, we're looking at this at, from the benefit of, of having the New Testament who describes in further detail who Jesus is, how he was there at creation, how he was a part of the work of creation, how he spoke it into being. And so we can read Isaiah chapter 9 and, and some of the weight and the significance of what he is describing here about Messiah can be missed and overlooked. But if you are a, a Jewish man or woman living at 700 B.C., I think that what Isaiah is saying here in these verses is almost hard for you to believe. It's so revolutionary, so radical. Because remember, to, to a faithful Jew, just the very name of God, Yahweh, was so revered 
and so sacred that to, to even speak it wasn't allowed. Out of fear that you might accidentally mispronounce it, that you might accidentally be irreverent. And so now Isaiah is saying that, that this God that you revere so highly, that he is the one that's so sacred and so holy, so entirely set apart, that, that he's the one who is eternal, creator God, whose name we won't out even speak out of fear of, 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 mis, uh, of mispronouncing it, out of respect for him. You're saying this God is the one who is coming to be our rescuer. Like this is almost too good to be true. It's, it's, it's literally for, for them beyond belief. And Isaiah says, yes. Yes, I'm telling you that he is our everlasting father. Isaiah wants them to understand that their Messiah who would come, the degree to which he was God, that he was fully in a divine, his divine nature was, was 100%. As Colossians, Paul writes in Colossians, he says, for in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. This is who Jesus is. This is who he is to us. Secondly, though, we also discover, I think Isaiah is speaking to the relational nature of the Messiah. He's speaking to the relational nature of the Messiah. And this is, this is where I think this terminology sort of breaks down for us or gets a bit confusing. Because as I mentioned earlier, when we think about him as everlasting father, this creates confusion for us because we more readily understand Jesus in terms of his sonship. When we talk about the Trinity, we talk about God the Father, Jesus Christ, his Son, and, and, and God is the Holy Spirit who lives in us and dwells among us and leads and guides us here and now. So all of this and the context is, as it relates to understanding the Trinity, God is one but in three persons, like our Historically, we've tried to create different analogies to explain this, right? People, some people will refer to it as, will think of it as, as water. They'll say God is, is all water, but sometimes he shows up as steam. Sometimes he shows up in liquid form. Sometimes he's ice. And, but, but that's sort of like uh, modalism when you think about it. It's, it's, it's God just sort of one God, but taking on different forms. And that's, that's not what scripture describes to us, or we'll talk about him as a, an egg and the different parts of an egg, and they all sort of fall short. There is a diagram that, that for me helps sort of wrap my head around the significance of the Trinity, and, and you see how um, at the center of it is, is the person of God, and God is the Father, and God is the Holy Spirit, and God is the Son, but the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is, is not the Son, and Again, our heads kind of swirl when we start to get into this. But when Isaiah is, is describing here the, the Son, the promised Messiah, as the everlasting Father, if he's not saying to us that the Father is, is leaving his form as Father and taking on the form as the Son, what is he saying? What does he want us to, to understand about this? And I think that this is, is Isaiah defining or explaining the type of relationship we can and we will have with the coming Messiah, that he is meant to be for us our everlasting father. When I was a, a student at Moody, I, um, this is actually where I met Sherry. My, my freshman year, we were in an introduction to psychology class, and we got put into a group project together and our, our um, group project at the time, we decided to study the correlation between how we viewed our, our biological, our earthly fathers, and the impact of that on how we understood and related to God. And so we surveyed all these students, and we asked them about and talked to them about their dads and their relationship with their dads and what that looked like, and, and then we went... And we talked about them, about how they would describe or define God and how they related to him. And there was, a, as you might suspect, just an incredible correlation. Because if, if they viewed their, their, and their relationship with their earthly father was 
distant or if it was defined by anger or all these different things, then how they understood God, even from a Christian perspective, we were talking to, to Christian kids here, their view on who God the Father was very much correlated, that he's disappointed in me, that I'm letting him down, that all this, is, and vice versa, if their relationship with their earthly father was was positive if it was defined by love and by his care and his provision and then oftentimes they would define how they understood god the father in in very similar terms and so even just isaiah's description you there, there's baggage that comes in with, with this just because of how we're wired to understand what it means for jesus to be our everlasting father because even if, if you had the very best dad in the entire world, he would still fall very short of the way Jesus relates to us, of, of who he is for us. Because Jesus is descri- or Isaiah is describing Jesus as the archetype, the embodiment of the perfect father. And we could, we could talk about this in a lot of ways, but I just simply want to mention two here. First, Jesus is the perfect father in the sense that that we receive perfect care from Jesus. Perfect care from Jesus. To help, to help um, define this or describe this, Isaiah would often use imagery of, of a shepherd with his sheep. In Isaiah 40, chapter, or, or, uh, chapter 40, verse 11, he says, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb into his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads them that have young. And there's, there's an incredible amount that we could actually look at as it relates to ancient Near East cultures and how shepherds would treat and relate to their sheep. It's, it's really very fascinating stuff. But, but for the sake of simplicity, understand that at the core of this imagery that Isaiah is using, it, it is about protection and provision. That Jesus would be our protector and our provider, and he does so with eternity in mind. See, the reality that he is our protector and our provider is not to say that we are spared from from pain and difficulty, from struggles, that that we'll never face need. We're not not naive enough to, to view it that way, to claim that. But it does, however, mean that by Jesus and through Jesus, our greatest need is met. Our our, our need for forgiveness of sin, our victory over our greatest enemy is secured. The one the Bible calls the accuser. It's Jesus who is the provision of grace. It's Jesus who, who protects us against the accusations of the evil one. And this is his care for us. But that again, secondly, like a shepherd, it's, it's experience, it's accomplished by his perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice of Jesus. If, if you are a parent, or really if you're in a, in a situation where you are the primary caregiver, someone, a, a teacher, if you're caring for a parent, you recognize that at the heart of that relationship, at the core of that is, is sacrifice. It's, it's a willingness to lay down your own needs and wants in order to provide and care for the other people under your care. See, this is what Jesus ultimately accomplishes for us. Jesus describes himself in the Gospel of John in chapter 10, verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So you see, as as we relate to who Jesus is, we understand him relationally as our perfect fatherly father, fatherly in his care for us, fatherly in his sacrifice for us. He would lay down his life so that we might live. Sam Storm, a, a, a theologian and an author, defines it this way, describes it. He says the word father is a descriptive analogy pointing us to Christ's character. What does a father do? What image is evoked by the word? I suggest he has in mind the tenderness and sensitivity of a compassionate and affectionate father. It is the security and love he provides as well as the protection and provision. Jesus, therefore, is fatherly, fatherlike in his treatment of us. This is similar 
to what the psalmist had in mind when he said, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Finally then, Isaiah's term here of everlasting father is intended to reveal the heart of God. Reveal the heart of our God. There's a, a moment in, um, in C.S. Lewis's uh, Narnia Chronicles where, where Lucy is going to meet Aslan, the Christ-like figure in, in the story for the very first time, and she is asking the beaver, in preparation for this, well, what is he like? How, how will, and, and she's anticipating that he is going to be in human form, and the beaver says to her um, that he's a lion, which causes almost sort of fear to, to well up in her. And she asks him the question, well, is he safe? And the beaver responds and says, well, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. See, Lucy's question, I think, speaks into a question that we all ask and all deal with as it relates to our understanding of God. And that is primarily, how do I understand how he views me? Who is he and how do I relate to him? How do I understand what this is supposed to look like? How do I know God's opinion in his heart towards us. This is one of the reasons I'm excited for Explore God this winter in January and February, because we're going to deal with these honest questions. And of course, we we have the benefit of having scripture that describes God for us, and we read that and take it in. We experience it, and, and things like nature and community, we see pictures and glimpses of his character and who he is, but I think he is most clearly revealed to us. It's, it's discovered for us when he takes on flesh And dwells among us. In fact, Jesus helps us understand this. He says in John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. If you want to understand who God is, what God is like, look at me. And then later in verse 38, the second half of that, he says, Know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. So how do we know what God is like? How, How do we understand his heart for us? We look to Jesus. See, God's God's pursuit of us is seen in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The heart of God for you, towards you, is revealed to us in the one who is our everlasting Father. His promise is, is eternal. When we place our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, he becomes our everlasting father. We are his, and he is ours forever. As the pastor and theologian Charles Spurgeon once said, there is no unfathering Christ, and there is no unchilding us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again that we can come to you as our everlasting father that we receive your care and your provision in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that you have made yourself known. We thank you that you are the fullness of God in human flesh. And Lord, we thank you that you invite us into relationship with you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.